morning flammers, fellow mathematicians. Doing the Gaussian integral today. Let's see how it turns out. And no, I'm not going to do it with polar coordinates. I'm going to do this in a different video. We are going to solve it using Popper's method. Just like I did with the Fresnel integrals, link in the description. We are going to do it that way. So using the Leibniz rule for integration on this one, Papa's way is the best. We are going to use it. <laughs> so we've got a symmetric integral right here. So that means let's check if it's odd or even. So if you plug in, in minus x into here, minus x squared is just x squared. So that means this function stays itself when plugging in minus x. And it also means that this right here is an even integral. So we can rewrite this integral from minus infinity to infinity as two times the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus a x squared dx. And this a right here is quite important. It's just a little factor. So it could be one half and you would get this probability integral or whatever it was. It doesn't matter and a is element of the real numbers. Okay, so what else can we do? We are going to call this bad boy right here i, just for simplification purposes. And we are going to construct ourselves a new integral with a parameterization. Parameterization, exactly, that's the word. So let's define i in terms of t. So how are we going to define it? That's the integral from 0 to t of e to the minus ax squared dx, but the whole thing squared. So what can we do with this information? Remember, we've, we are just using this to express this integral right here a little bit different. So I want you guys to notice that our original i is nothing else than two times the square root of i when t approaches infinity. So that's all there is to it. And like I said before, we are going to use the Leibniz rule. If you don't know what that is, just take a look in the description. There will be a link to the corresponding video. Whew. I'm saying this sentence so often. <laughs> okay, so we want to differentiate i in terms of t now. Let's do that. So di in terms of t dt. Well, what is that? We want to apply the differential to this function right here. So at first we need to use the product rule. We've got a squared right here. So this is two times the integral from zero to t of e to the minus ax squared dx. And now we have to use the whole Leibniz rule for integration on this one. So there are a few terms we still need to include. So what do we need at first? We need the integral from zero to t of the partial derivative in terms of t of e to the minus ax squared dx. And you might see it or you don't, but differentiating this integrand in terms of t would just give zero. So we are summing up a lot of zeros, so this integral becomes zero. So that's great. That becomes simplified. And now the next part. We need to evaluate a constant at the point t, our upper bound. So we get e to the minus a t squared and, well, dt over dt and this is just one. So that's great. And there's the last part to it. We need to subtract a constant evaluated at the lower bound. So this is e to the minus a times zero. Okay, but squared and then d of zero dt. Well, that's just the constant and this is zero. So what we end up with, let's close the parentheses right here, is two times the integral from zero to t of e to the minus a. Let's factor out the a on this one. Let's bring this inside the integral. We can do that. It's just a constant when it comes to this integral. Um, x squared plus t squared dx. Whew. So that was only the first part. And we are going to denote this as i prime in terms of t. So that's what it is. It's just a derivative. Uh, let's put it here. i prime in terms of t. That's what it is. Okay, so what now? Remember, we somehow want to go back to i in terms of t and let it go to infinity. But now we are at i prime. So we need to rewrite this a little bit. And we want to integrate this i prime of t in terms of t later. So keep this in mind. So what could we do now? Well, at first, 
that doesn't look any better than the original integral. So let's introduce a u substitution for example. So let some u equal to, hmm, what do we want it to equal? Um, maybe we could factor out a t squared right here in the exponent. Maybe that does something good. That's two times the integral from zero to t of e to the minus a t squared and then x over t but the whole thing squared. I'm going to put it that way to make it more clear. And then positive one dx. Oh, that's a mess. <laughs> okay. So now we want to let u equal to x over t. That's the basic idea. And well, if we differentiate that, that means that t times du is nothing else than dx. So what have we gathered until now? We now know that i prime of t is nothing else than the integral from 0 to t of 2 times t e to the minus a t squared and then u squared plus 1 du. So that's our integral now and we want to work with this on the next blackboard. I know I'm repeating myself but remember we want to integrate this later on. So somehow we want to go back to i in terms of t. And the great thing is if we would somehow integrate a differential in terms of t that would just give us the integrand itself. So what does that mean? Maybe we could express this integrand right here as something else. So here's a little observation. Observe that 2 times t e to the minus a t squared u squared plus 1 is nothing else than. Well, we could rewrite that. That's the partial derivative in terms of t of e to the minus a t squared u squared plus 1 over and well, that's just a u squared plus 1 and don't forget your negative sign my boys. I hope you agree with me that this is true because if we differentiate this up here in terms of t, we would just end up with this expression right here. So we want this to cancel out. So we can plug this in. I prime of t is now the integral from 0 to t of the partial derivative in terms of t of minus e to the minus a t squared u squared plus 1 over a times u squared plus 1 du. And I forgot something, to be honest. We did a substitution, so that means we have to also change our upper and lower bounds. I'm always forgetting that. I'm terribly sorry. So if we plug in 0 into here, our lower bound would change, wouldn't change. And if we plug in t into here, well, that's just 1. So our upper bound is 1. I'm sorry for that. Sometimes I'm a little bit stupid. So this is also one and this is also one. Never mind, I corrected myself. And the great thing is we can kind of reverse the Leibniz rule now because our upper bound isn't dependent on t anymore. So that means we can just interchange the integral sign and the partial derivative. So that's a special case of the Leibniz rule. That's what we can do. So now we have the derivative in terms of t of the integral from 0 to 1 of minus e to the minus a t squared u squared plus 1 over a times u squared plus 1 du. That's a lot of writing. And here's what I meant before. If we integrate i prime of t now in terms of t, that would mean we kind of let the differential right here and the integral cancel out and we would just end up with this integral right here, this integrand, plus some c. So let me write what we just gathered. That means that the integral of i prime of t dt is nothing else than i in terms of t and well what is that? That's the integral of the differential of the integral from 0 to 1 of minus e to the minus a t squared u squared plus 1 over a times u squared plus 1 and du dt. So let me put it that way and here's what I said before. This and that will kind of cancel out. It's something that just holds and 
we would just end up with this part right here plus some C. Absolutely amazing. Here's one problem. We've got a C right here, so we need to get rid of this C. Don't forget, my boys, this is I of t. And that's an expression for I of t, but also I of t is this right here. That's the integral from 0 to t of e to the minus a x squared dx, but the whole thing squared. So one way we could get rid of the c right here is if we, for example, would get rid of this right side. So that this expression would equal to zero, for example. So we can isolate the c and we get a value for c. So how can we do that? Well, we could just plug in zero, for example. If we plug in zero into t, that means we get the integral from zero to zero. And we know if we have an integral from a to a, that's just zero. So that would be absolutely amazing. So we can conclude that i in terms of zero is nothing else than zero. So that's that part right here. And if we plug in zero into here, well, our minus stays and this one over a also stays. So we can bring this to the outside. So let's conclude this first. So that's minus one over a. What else do we get? Hmm. If we plug in zero into here, that's e to the zero of power and that's just one. So that's the integral from zero to one of du over u squared plus one and also plus c. That's nice and fine because we know how to integrate that. That's just the inverse tangent of u from 0 to 1. Link in the description to the corresponding video. And we can also bring the c to the other side or this term to the other side. We would get rid of the negative sign. So we can conclude that c is nothing else than minus 1 over a and no, not minus, positive times the inverse tangent of u from 0 to 1. Inverse tangent of 0 is just 0 and the inverse tangent of 1 is well pi over 4. You can calculate it by hand, you can plug it into your calculator. I don't exactly care, but we end up with 1 over a times pi over 4. That's nice. So that means that our i in terms of t is nothing else than this expression plus this one right here. And our original formula was, our original um, idea was to express i so that i is nothing else than 2 times the square root of i of t going to infinity. So that's nice. We can actually compute this now because we've got all the information we need. So what is i? i is nothing else than 2 times a big square root of Okay, so i going to infinity. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of minus e to the minus a and then the limit. The exponential function is indeed continuous, so we can bring the limit to the exponent. And also we don't really need to care about the integral, I guess. This limit will dominate. So t approaches infinity of t squared u squared plus 1 over a times u squared plus 1 du and then positive 1 over a pi over 4. Whew, that's a huge expression but it will cancel out nicely because if we let t approach infinity on here so that's e to the minus infinity that's 1 over e to the infinity 1 over infinity that becomes 0 so this whole expression BAM like Dr. Payam would say bang bang into the room okay <laughs> so all we need to do is simplify this right here so this is now 2 times the square root of pi over a times 4, 4 times a, I don't care which order. And the square root of 4 is just 2, so that means 2 and 2 will cancel out, so our final answer is square root pi over a. God damn it, the chalk just landed on my jacket, and it's indeed a dark one. <sighs> that wasn't too smart of me. But I hope you enjoyed this video. In my opinion, I did this way more um, enthusiastic than my Frenet integral video. 
Maybe it's because I've done so many English videos now that I feel way more confident than in the beginning. But if you like this video, please like and subscribe, recommend me if you like. And well, if you want to support me a bit more, link to my Patreon will be in the description. And up until the next video, have a flammable day. See ya! Oh, war nicht zu spät.